Dungeons of Aether. Or is it Aether? Wait, the opening has voice acting. Let's find out together. There was a battle between the elemental forces of Aether. Oh, okay then. Dungeons of Aether is a dungeon crawling RPG released by Aether Studios in February of 2023. And I'm a c c c c cut back. And let me talk about Aether Studios as a whole. I'll admit, bringing this up does kind of go against one of my later points of this video, but I don't care. Dungeons of Aether is part of the Aether universe, and this world is cool as snow, but I was introduced to it through Rivals of Aether. Rivals of Aether is godlike, one of my favorite games for sure, and I don't typically say that about multiplayer games. It's a platform fighter that's so good that honestly other platform fighting games are still trying to catch up with what Rivals mastered, and I've been with this game for a while. How long? I have the early access skins, obtained by having early access to this game back in 2015. I know, I'm gamer excellent. Rivals is out there, it's just one of the funnest games to move around in. I could play this by myself and still have a blast just wave dashing around platforms all day. Like if y'all aren't sure how cool Rivals of Aether is, it has a trans mask moth. And he's this rebel punk with bombs! Malo is cooler than me, and honestly, he's cooler than you. And I will buy a plushie of him if they make one. And I'll put him right by my Rano plush, and everything will be one hundo. But yeah, Aether Studios is one of my favorite gaming studios for sure. Just the care they had to spend all those years to get rollback netcode on Rivals is telling. We got these lame-o companies making haha -ha jokes about dating sim versions of their games that don't even exist for cheap April Fools jokes. Meanwhile, Giga Chat Aether Studios actually released a full-on dating sim with these characters. Like, catch me going out with my boy Rano. Damn! And my OG boy Orkane? Buddy, that's just drip. Game is funny as hell too, I love it. No lie, going on a date with my main? I can't help but feel a deeper connection when I play him in game. I mean, I don't know, I started hitting my dash attack cancel up strongs more frequently. Things were hitting different. God, I love this frog. And yeah, I didn't have any replays, so I actually had to go online to get some gameplay footage. Which means my beyond rusted butt had to get montaged by f***ing Hodan. Shoutouts to Grinder less time for being on to get some games then. I know what y'all are thinking, whoa, Spacey! Don't just call them out like that. Arcade anonymity. And yeah, true. But if you're teabagging me with Hodan, then it's clear you have a message you want to send out. So yeah. I was already a fan of Rivals, and it's cool to see them branch out and create a universe out of Aether, which leads us to Dungeons of Aether. Some of y'all might think I'm a little biased coming into this being a huge Rivals fan, but uh, Goofy, this is Dungeons of Aether, not Rivals. Sorry. And in my defense, I can freely admit that I didn't like Creatures of Aether. Cool game, not for me. So I wasn't biased or anything like that going into this. So let's stop screwing around and start talking about the game. This game takes place in the world of Aether. Long ago, a battle between the people of Aether and the darkness, known as the Abyss, reshaped the land. The people of Aether came together. The elements of fire, air, ground, and water sealed away this darkness. All this occurred under the magnificent Jules Vale, where in the present day, those seeking treasures and adventures head in to the mines underneath for journeys of wealth and more. But there may still be a terrible darkness under there. This is cool because Jules Vale was actually a playable location in Rivals of Aether. It has one of the coolest openings too with the sun rising. Oh, hold up, let me just show y'all. Hyper golly. So here we are on the title screen. I will say, 
while the title is accurate, it can lead to a lot of misconceptions with how the gaming world may perceive that title and the expectations brought forth from it. And while some of y'all are bringing out your translation notes trying to understand what the hell I'm talking about this time around, I mean that despite the name, this game isn't a roguelike. I'd barely call it a roguelite. Levels aren't randomized, they're all pre-made with set encounters and events that don't change even upon leaving and revisiting. The only thing random are treasure chests, enemy drops, supposedly, and I guess what's at the shop. There is a mode on the title screen called Challenge Dungeons, which actually does give randomized dungeons, but that's, that's its own mess, and probably should be like, locked behind beating the game. I mean, you aren't going to play it until you understand how the game plays, and it kind of just spoils the story. Th this isn't the selling point of the game, ignore it. But with that in mind, let's head into the story. It should be noted that the narrative director of Aether Studios is Ian Flynn. Some of y'all might recognize this guy. He's done a ton of work. Most notably, the Archie Comic Sonic series. I've never read any of his work, not even the Tales of Aether comic. Which is wild because those comics got Molo in it, like, dang, am I a true Molo fan if I didn't read these? I think it's kind of funny that, like, Ian Flynn working for Aether Studios isn't listed anywhere outside of Rivals News. Not even on any of his wiki pages, like, is this universe this unknown? Are we this obscure that this guy who has seemingly done work that tons of people have interacted with gets no recognition? It's weird that his story just ends at Archie Comics, like he's still doing things, he's doing this. I guess this kind of leads to a point that I want to talk about later, so for now, let's get into this. Starting out, we're given a difficulty selection. It defaults to the super easy story difficulty, which makes me wonder how people still complain that this game was too hard. Meanwhile, I played on advanced for like 30 minutes until I was like, nah, this is too easy and played hard for the rest of the game. We begin with the one, and thankfully only, Fleet. The self-proclaimed Archer of Justice on the mission to take out the corrupt corporation, Badger Co., which has been ruling over her hometown, Julesvale. Somewhat partnering up with Ayala, an ex-Badger Co. member, to help put a dent into Badger Co. Starting out, Isla tells her to find some blueprints to get some intel on the enemy, and off we go, going through a tutorial dungeon, snatching some blueprints, and eventually leading us to fighting one of these machines Badger Co. is using. By this point, Isla and the player both realize that Fleet is actually a pretty crappy person, so Isla tells her to screw off. We however, are still stuck with her, as she runs into old man Randall, the town elder and peddler of this substance known as Imsidian a valuable and popular commodity of revitalizing powers. Randall is in need of help, explaining that he asked three other people to help him, but they all betrayed him, so he's kind of on a losing streak. And this leads us to meeting the three other characters of this game, each representing one of the four elements. So let's talk about these characters. As I've already kind of illustrated, I don't really like Fleet, but I like that I don't like her, you know? If a character has enough personality that I can say I don't like them, then that's better than just being a blank board I feel nothing about. It's funny, because I feel like Aether Studios is trying to push this character so hard, but she's just so unlikable. I think her attitude is sort of obnoxious, like I don't know, she's just annoying. I like how you can read about her just causing trouble for everyone while trying to stop Badger Co. Like she's just a nuisance to everyone. But you know, I'll give her credit. Fleet gets things done, you don't see anyone else trying to stop Badger Co, and she is fighting for what she believes is a just cause. She's very unlikable, but as the game goes on, she definitely betters herself. And I'm glad that they were brave enough to write a main character who is unlikable, and learns to get better over time, instead of just making her some superhero with no repercussions for her actions. I'm not sure if I particularly like her still, but she is pretty interesting. With her being the air elemental hero of this game, let's check out the rest. First up, we have Slade, representing the water element. Hailing from the Polokai Islands, he's a shark pirate that headed to Julesvale with the most expected mission of hunting for some treasure. He's very charming, and is a pretty nice guy all things considered, I mean, 
being a pirate and all. That's really the face value mark, but there is a reason he's searching for treasure. The game shows he's more benevolent in his deeds and interested in helping others rather than just being some jerkish crook. And yeah, I mean, I'll just be honest. I think he's... He's... He's pretty fine, you know? Like, I gotta thank for shark dudes. I gotta thank for pirates. So when you combine the two, I mean, you got my attention. But I can hold myself back, you know? Can't leave a bad representation. You know, rivals of Aether fans, we aren't all weirdos, right? Y'all don't need to see what I originally said about Slade in the first draft of this script. But let's just say... I've matured enough to say that I can stare respectfully at this fine gentleman. He does have a pretty nice tail though. Okay, don't leave. The tail is important to some people, yeah? He's cute, okay? Damn! So yeah, mm, Shark Pirate is cool as hell. I wasn't very good with him for a while though. He's kind of complicated. I mean, arguably all these characters are. But I appreciated him a lot more once I learned how to play him better. But at the time, I wasn't really messing with his gameplay. Which kind of sucks because I was hype as hell to play as Slade. But it's also what made it all the more surprising when the next character ended up being my favorite one. Representing the ground element, it's my boy Hemir. Or Hammer. Kind of a corny name, like get it? He uses hammers. Yeah. He's a Pangorian X. Well, X quite a few things. But notably, an ex wall runner. Wall runners are these people who dedicate their life to protecting this large wall that protects the forest. And I mean it, for their whole life. They don't leave, they stay at that wall. I once knew one named Crag. Dude was a gamer excellent. So what's Hemir doing here? Well, it's kind of complicated. One day an incident occurred at the rock wall, killing his lifelong boyfriend Maddock. Abandoning the rock wall, Hammer doesn't actually have a reason to come to Julesvale. He's just lost and not entirely sure what to do with his life now. I'm trying not to go too deep on these characters yet, but I love him here. He's so cool. I came to this game as a Slade fan, and I can tell y'all I came out as a Hammer stan. He's also my favorite gameplay wise, which I'll get into later. Very enjoyable character. Golly. Anyways, who's next? Oh god, Artemis. Get a load of this one. A dragon hailing from the Fire Empire, she comes into Julesvale immediately like, Dang, this place could be a threat to the Empire. I should tell my Emperor to conquer this one. Like, here we f go, can't stand these fire people. I mean, Forest Baron was cool, but that guy knew the Empire was an L. She's here because the coronation of the new Emperor, Loxodon, is incomplete. Due to the stealing of the Rite of Fire, I think some shadowy purple whale dog thing stole it, something like that. So yeah, some guy named Zetterburn is after it, but for now, Artemis is here to obtain a new relic in case of Zetterburn's failure, and with Julesvale rumored to be full of relics and artifacts, surely she can find something worthy. Personality wise, Artemis is a grade A mega jerk. She's just here to take treasure and beat up anyone in her way. I don't like her, but I actually do like her. She's brash, blows up on everyone, and works for a pretty crappy empire with the kind of pride that they'll conquer the world. Like, she's a low-key villain in any other game. But that's what also makes her interesting. Besides her underlying intent of wanting to be the Empress, by pure circumstance of the story, she ends up becoming a hero. It's like we start off with what would otherwise be the tale of a villain helping out an evil empire. But she gets wrapped up with these other characters that she doesn't even like and now she's gotta be a good person. And I'm glad that these characters aren't just a bunch of typical goody two-shoes stepping up to make the world a better place. The only real one that is is Fleet, who is still a little selfish on her own but she's the only one who actually cares about her, her town Julesvale. Regardless, these other three also meet Randall, and they're tasked with finding certain relics within the mines, being given a mysterious crystal known as Amsidian. A powerful and valuable item with a lot of different uses as encouragement to help Randall out. Everything beyond here I'd say is spoilery, especially considering the length of this game, but I'll say the search for artifacts does eventually lead to the characters meeting up, and not in the most peaceful way either. I have some more to say on these characters and the story, but we'll get into that later. For now, let's start diving into some other aspects. By now, Y'all might have noticed something. This game looks amazing. 
And yeah, this is some S tier pixel art. I mean, Rivals was always a gorgeous game in my eyes. We'll always be sad that the sequel is choosing to go 3D. It kind of sucks that people will look at pixel graphics and automatically call it bad or outdated. This stuff is beautiful. And just like pixel art has always been and always will be, it's timeless. From the beautiful backgrounds to the expressive and fluid character animations and pretty heads up display, it all looks fantastic, top notch. Like I was low key stretching my neck with hammer and I wasn't even noticing I was vibing so hard to this. And the power delivered by some of these attacks just feel good. Yeah, sure, maybe graphics aren't everything. But what a better way to make me care about a world than to make it look this colorful. Like, shoot! I want to pack my bags right now and head out to Julesville. I can say that for a lot of places in the Aether world, really. Honestly, I'd want to live at one of the island places. Like, Merchant Port would be pretty cool. I mean, before it got burned to the ground by Gufo. But if that wasn't enough, the visuals get hit by a double whammy with the music. I mean, Rival's music was already some top-notch soundage, and this is still that flashy goodness, flashy goodness. Like, if y'all haven't listened to Oceanic Breeze before, I'm gonna be honest, your life just isn't complete. Like, here, let me give you a hand before it's too late. Well, I mean, while we're already here... I could go in any direction, really. These are some of my favorite gaming songs, for sure. Oh wait, Tower of Heaven? Do y'all remember that game? Ah, I gotta talk about it sometime. Anyways, Dungeon of Ether's soundtrack is beyond fantastic. It not being just a fighting game gives some more space for other musical tones rather than just music for fights. But with that in mind, the battle songs in this game are probably my favorite. It's just such a unique sound. I love the differing instruments paired with each element that makes them so much more distinct. It characterizes elements with music. Near the end, the songs just start getting wild. Some of the final dungeon fight themes, the final boss theme, might be one of the greatest final boss songs put into a game. I mean that whole final fight was, <sighs> what an experience. There's one dungeon song near the end that's kind of this chill sad song matching the tone and seriousness of the current events of the story, and it's a good vibe. I like it because it's a more sort of somber version of the theme usually heard in connection with Jules Vale. Jules Vale itself having its own theme makes it feel like a character of its own, which nicely gets lay motifed into several songs, as after all, this is a game where the main location is Jules Vale. It's some good jams, so yeah, Fitting the Aether checkbook of having some of the best art and music put into a video game, how does the gameplay fare? And well, I'm so glad to be able to tell y'all. Let's finally get into the gameplay. Everything revolves around this game's battle system, so I'll dive headfirst into that, and finally explain to y'all what the hell you're looking at with these fights. So let's talk about these stats. Attack, defense, Accuracy, Speed, Attack. 
Characters have these purple border skills, known as connect skills, that typically deal damage. If my attack is higher than my opponent's defense, then I will be able to attack the opponent with these connect skills. Defense will protect me against my opponent's direct attacks if it is higher or equal to the opponent's attack. So if my defense is higher than their attack, I'm safe this turn. Accuracy is simple. Check my skills. Skills have different thresholds of accuracy needed to use them, a meter filling up. So starting out a round, all I get are my basic attack and guard. I raise my accuracy, and I get a lot more options. Speed is the easiest. If my speed is higher or equal to the opponent's, I'll go first. If not, they'll perform their action first. So y'all might have noticed by now these dice shenanigans being used to increase these stats. This is the draft phase, and I know just hearing that is making some of y'all gamers scream in terror, but here's how it works. The player and opponent take turns choosing dice. The color and number on these dice determine how much we'll be able to increase our stats. After choosing our dice, we reach the phase where we can use our skills and see what options are available with our stats. The player can also choose to move around their dice into different slots, allowing us to adjust our stats and strategy. While it's possible to mismatch colors by moving something like attack red die into defense, it will only ever increase that stat by 1 for having the incorrect color, and if dice are set to 1, they can't be moved. Also, for the colorblind gamers, this game has settings to change the dice colors so one's more friendly, because this game was made by rockers. There's two dice I'm yet to mention. Also yeah, I'll be real with y'all, I know they're like die singular, dice plural or something, but I'm just gonna be using dice for singular and plural, because one, I don't really care, I don't think it matters that much, and two, I mean, if I keep saying the word die throughout this whole video, then I don't know what YouTube is going to do to it. But, mostly because I don't think it matters that much. Two dice I haven't mentioned yet. First, this golden dice, shining with the beauty of versatility. Known as stamina dice, these can fit into any slot and give their full effect. With their biggest importance in being able to switch them after the draft to adjust my stats. Very good for baiting out enemy stamina too, which I'll get into later. These dice can be very valuable, always leading to tough decisions like, do I take the red 6 die, or the 4 golden die? That's good decision making during drafting that the player is going to have to make. This game has progression in the sense of constantly adding new rules and mechanics to the game, to always keep things fresh without having to worry about the base game getting stale. An example of this are the purple dice that show up later on, that once again adds a whole different degree of choice to really amplify the drafting into strategic chaos. Purple dice represents a color, however, that color can only be seen after it's drafted. So if I see a 4 red dice, or a purple 6 dice, which one is more worth it? Especially during a turn where I want to attack. This dice has the potential to completely change my strategy of the turn, or reward me big by becoming a stamina die. This dice and drafting system is so genius. Other RPGs have characters who equip items to change their attributes and create builds, but here, every draft I'm making a new build for my character, constantly reshaping them. Like is the enemy at 1 HP? Then I'll go for a glass cannon build, high speed, high attack, to defeat the enemy not caring about my defense because they won't be able to strike back. But maybe I'll see that I've already lost the speed game, and forfeit my speed dice to instead go for a tank build, increasing my accuracy and focusing on using techniques to help me the next turn, especially useful after an opponent buffs themselves or debuffs me, hunker down and wait for the storm to pass. This system really just leads to infinite situations and strategies, constant moments of oh I can do that during battles that never ends. I could be in the same battle and handle it in so many different ways, regardless of the differences already brought from my character and their equipped items, just from the dice itself. 
is that reactive randomness of being given total luck and seeing how I can unscramble this into my favor. It's a puzzle in its own way, locked in a puzzle box within a puzzle box. But it still is fair. The player gets first draft. You can see what skill the enemy is going to use. You only need to tie your speed to go faster than them. It's incredible. But I can't give my overall thoughts when I've only gone over so little. There's one more stat I'm yet to mention. Unable to be directly raised through stat die, similar to the existence of character health and how it carries through battles, is stamina. Y'all might have noticed these pluses next to character stats, so sometimes this dice draft stuff isn't in your favor, or you know, you just screw up. So in scenarios where it looks like you lost the draft and will be punished, well, if you have stamina. That's right, we're gonna cheat. So yeah, stamina is the cheat codes. I wasn't too big of a fan of this at first. It felt too forgiving, and like I could win a lot of encounters just using this, patching up my mistakes. But stamina can be pretty difficult to recover, and enemies have their own staminas that they can cheat code with as well. And let's just say you aren't gonna beat them unless if you have hacks too. Tougher enemies later on will even reactively adjust with their stamina to your decisions. The AI is really good, at least on hard, and it made for a super fun challenge, if not brutal. Sometimes to the point where a part of my strategy is just trying to burn my opponent's stamina, slowly whittling away at it as if it's a shield, because it basically is. A powerful, versatile tool for both player and foe, used offensively, used defensively, used strategically. As while my opponent's stamina won't matter once they're defeated, the stamina I use will last for the rest of the game. Spending all my stamina on one fight will have repercussions to later battles, where I'm potentially walking in with no stamina. Stamina is super costly, and not just for the reason that it will hinder future cheats, but all characters rely on stamina in some way that makes it an extremely powerful resource. I'd say every character but Fleet are put in an extremely dire situation without any stamina. They rely on it. This is because as y'all would imagine, characters have differing mechanics. And it's not just simple stuff that would make them all generally play similar. These characters play by completely different rules. It's a whole different game. I was actually laughing in excitement just reading these characters talking about their differences like Slay just sliding into the game like Oh yeah, defense dice doesn't do anything for me. Which I think makes this a pretty solid time to discuss the characters and their differences. I will say, characters sort of change throughout the story. Not only in the fact that they unlock skills to slowly tutorialize the player, but also because of certain scenario moments, often tying story to gameplay. Fleet is an interesting example because she starts off pretty basic to give the player a good handle on the game. She seems pretty boring at first when compared to the other characters we get to try, and actually kind of leaves the story for quite a while. The player spending more time with the other heroes, but when Fleet returns, she's fully formed with some new passives and abilities. Fleet can have a lot of synergy with more items than the other characters, I feel. I'll get into equipment later, but some, alongside skills, can give dice to the player for the next turn, such as buff techniques. If Fleet has higher than 5 stamina, she'll automatically spend that stamina to convert all granted dice at pre-draft into that golden stamina dice. That's really her only big advantage. She's an honest character that really has to play the rules of the game, not having much for skipping, being the only character to lack a skill that deals 2 damage to the opponent. But maybe that's why she's my least favorite character to play as. She just doesn't really have much interesting things going on. And I feel like fights with her just generally last longer. Not having much to break from the control of drafts. And usually just needing to play within them rather than relying on some sort of cheese. So even if a draft wants me to play a certain way I can still rise against that destiny but not with Fleet. Her passive with the dies changing into stamina die isn't really that useful. Like, 
I'd rather her just not use up my stamina on that. It's basically just lose one stamina every turn. And regaining stamina can be tough with her, needing to build up a ton on technique and defense. Even then, Snack only gives stamina if it's below 4, and Snipe requires me to hit it, which means having 7 accuracy while also having the attack to hit the opponent and defense to block an attack, which on hard mode, yeah that just is impossible, you aren't going to steamroll the enemy with having better stats with them in every category, you're going to lose somewhere. So overall, Fleet, not for me, but she is kind of the least reliant on stamina, but in some ways she does kind of have to rely on stamina because she has no other cheats. I don't know, Fleet's weird. Let's move on to the next character the player gets to use. Slade. Yeah, now we're talking about the hot stuff. I mean, gameplay wise, not... Okay, yeah, I hope none of the devs are watching this. I just love this shark. Here's how Slady works. As previously mentioned, defense dice only increases his stats by one, no matter what number is on it. Stamina still increases it normally though, which may make defense dice seem pretty useless to grab, but you can still make sure the opponents don't grab it. But with that kind of passive, it sure sounds like Slade is going to get hit often. Well, the other part of his passive is that as long as he has 3 stamina, and is outspeeding the opponent, he'll spend that stamina to guarantee dodge an enemy's attack. This is what I mean with characters that break the rules and can do their own thing. Slade is the king of boosting speed plus power and just getting free hits. I honestly struggled a ton with him at first, but that was because I was sleeping on his skills. Slade's skills revolve around him having money, ideally gained from using his steel command, or a certain useful equipment item practically made for Slade. Slade can utilize money to deal 2 hearts of damage, or the super useful bribe, paying out 2 stamina for every dice in his defense stat, which can often give him near full refills. He's one of the best at refilling stamina for sure. When I learned to use bribe more to keep my stamina healthy, alongside getting some items that synergize well with him, I really began to enjoy this dude. Second favorite character to play for sure. Just a very aggressive character, and it feels nice knowing that I can slip by and get away with so much, knowing that I basically have invincibility. But who the hell cares? Hammer is my favorite character to play, and I'll tell you why. I love Hammer, oh my god. Story wise too, I was talking how honest Fleet was. Well Hammer is so honest, he can't even use hacks to increase his stats with stamina. Which is already a plus for me, because I was never a fan of that mechanic. Instead, at the start of his turn, he'll get a golden die valued at half his stamina. So if I have 4 stamina, I'll get a golden 2 die. If I'm at 8 stamina, I'll get a golden 4 die. But at max stamina, that's a freebie golden 5. On the other hand, Hamir loses 2 stamina from attacking, and gains 2 from blocking. So yeah, his playstyle is a little pop-tartish, with having no skills that regain stamina, which I'm not the biggest fan of. I guess it can be said that he regains stamina by using skills that result in him blocking attacks from higher defense. One such skill I really enjoy is Pivot, transferring all attack stamina die into defense, perfectly setting up an attack to defend combo. Another important skill is Extend which doubles his passive, granting the user 2 stamina dice instead of 1. And this is the idea behind Hamir, versatility. He may not be able to use stamina, but with these stamina dice at his disposal, he can really adapt to enemy situations on the fly without having to rely on using stamina to patch up leaks. He's the character I found myself spending the longest on turns with, moving the dice around to get a handle on any situation, often allowing me to use his max accuracy skill with advantage in both speed and attack. Quake. And no, get your bunny hopping butt out of here, I'm talking about this Quake. This attack costs 3 stamina to deal 2 hearts of damage, but can speed up the pace of most hammer fights by just ending the fight. It's kinda hard to get RNG screwed by him, but he's the character that suffers the most by having low stamina. So items that aid in regaining stamina are very important because once he runs low, then things are dire. Hamir was definitely made for me. 
a big ol' honest cutie that turns the game genie off and turns the brain on. Love this dude. Put him in Rivals too. But with that in mind, I'd say Artemis is the complete opposite. I absolutely couldn't stand playing as her at first. Her only saving grace for me was the fact that when I first got her, I bought the spike shield equipment, giving me a free 6 red dice from taking damage. Artemis' mechanic is extremely simple. If she has 5 stamina and gets attacked, unable to defend, she'll just restore that health. Which kind of puts her on similar grounds with Slade, as a character that just doesn't care about defense die. With certain items such as the mirror, which damages the foe once per fight after hitting the player, she can be OD broken. Artemis is all about knowing when you can take a trade. Building up stamina to be put into situations where you can come out damaging a foe and in return only losing 5 stamina. It does feel nice not having to worry about every turn, knowing that I'm invincible if I get 5 stamina. She has some mad useful skills too that shape with the idea. Her max accuracy skill being an attack that deals 2 damage with recoil of 1 damage to herself. But also a couple skills that become stronger when she's at lower health. So she's never really down and she's the only character with real comeback mechanics like that. Like her demand skill is incredible. Giving her 4 stamina when she's at 1 hit point. Which is super clutch. Especially with certain items like the spiked shield. Allowing her to retaliate the next turn. But yeah. My thoughts on her are a little skewed, because I never played her without the spike shield equipment, but I can imagine it'd lead to her getting sort of death looped. 5 stamina is expensive, and her base stats act like her defense doesn't exist. It's highly likely that she's going to get hit every turn, so you just need to speed run it, and hopefully not break yourself on the opponent, because that's still a game over. This is why I like Slade more. 3 stamina to avoid damage is a lot nicer with the freedom it gives me to dance in a battle. And trust me, I like dancing with Slade. Which is why Artemis is my third favorite character to play. Favorite bit of a stretch of a word. I only enjoyed playing her with certain items, but still. So yeah, that's my fun tier list of the characters. Though regardless, the base game in itself of the drafting and the dice I already mentioned I found to be enjoyable enough regardless of who I was playing as. They're just an extra spice to a finished meal. But with the battle system finally covered, I can talk about the things around it. Map exploration. Y'all have already seen it, the player moves around by clicking tiles on the map. Sometimes there are enemies, shops, whack ass dungeon gimmicks, and more. There's some event like NPCs, ones to bring items to in order to get items, others requesting items in return for gold. The locked safe is neat, the player needing to look around the dungeon for symbols in order to solve it. But yes, encounters are mostly set, and that's totally fine. It doesn't feel as linear as it looks, and there are optional places to go and decisions to make, such as going out of my way to get the journal entries from my gamer scoop alongside others. With the dungeons themselves having their own gimmicks and events to make them stand out. Also, as mentioned earlier, they aren't randomized, as seen by players being able to leave and re-enter, or restarting floors upon defeat. Speaking of which, when the player returns to Julesville, there's quite a number of shops for them. The bank for storing items, the inn for recovering stamina, the blacksmith for upgrading character stats, don't know how a blacksmith can upgrade a tail, but let's go with it. An item shop of shifting items, and a store to buy that rare substance I was talking about, Imsidian. Imsidian can be used to upgrade shops, opening more slots of storage, regaining more stamina from in resting, etc. My gamers. These services cost gold, and I'll personally say the blacksmith is the most important. A permanent upgrade to a base stat is something that will always be in effect in battles, and just having that one or two extra speed could make or break a fight. But I'm a goofer and favored on upgrading the item store. So what's this item stuff about, Spacey? Well, the player can hold 10 items technically, 6 offhand in general inventory, fitted for anything, but where consumables can be used. Then there are 3 slots for equipment. Having a variety of effects I'll get into, and one last one specifically for the weapon. 
While the character's weapon can't be changed, the gym inserted into it can. Gyms having effects on battles usually needing to be activated manually. But let's start with the consumables. Some examples of these are food items, which restore stamina, scrolls, which can have a variety of in-battle effects, or potions, which grants dye of a specific color for pinchy situations. One thing pretty neat about these potions is that after using them, a bottle is left behind. Most dungeons have floors with water. The game never explains it, but stepping on these tiles will refill these bottles with water, creating an item that spawns a single one value stamina die, which there aren't too much for builds in this game, but an inventory of bottles is one that sounds really fun to me. The hydration build. Because it's like an infinite consumable, you can use them every fight and then just refill them. It's a neat interaction. But some characters like Hamir are definitely going to enjoy having the food that gives them stamina. There aren't a ton of equipment items, but on the plus side, all the equipment are interesting in some way. It's not just equip this to increase the attack stat by 2. They all have their own conditions and situations for activation. Stuff like only activating when low on stamina, activating when the opponent uses stamina, at the start of fights, some items I need to activate manually. I already mentioned the spike shield activating when taking damage, so yeah, even the equipment has mechanics, like smaller characters of their own. Though I'll be honest, I found a lot of the equipment, while interesting, to be pretty useless or just extremely situational. All of the gems also fall in that category, which is why I feel like the bonus randomized challenge dungeon mode just doesn't work. It feels very tacked on and extremely luck based with how unbalanced these items are. This game was designed with the idea of characters being upgraded and having equipment. It was made with progression. So to just shove the player against the final boss and say, good luck, without much care for what they have, I feel like that mode is just a showcase on why this randomized gameplay doesn't really work for this game. Like if you don't have items for the last boss in that mode, then it's just not possible. It is overall harmless though, and I guess if I want a quick burst of gameplay, I'll play that mode. But if I really want to sit down and enjoy this game, I'll just play through the story mode again. I feel like it's where all aspects shine the most, especially items. Still, this game's design is amazing. I found it to be just such a fun and unique strategic experience. I can't imagine people describing this game as a simple small dungeon crawler when there is quite a bit to explore. Maybe not in length, but in depth. Speaking of, I was rather surprised at some of the responses I saw of this game. Yeah, I know, I accidentally looked at reviews again. My L. Like, I don't know how strategy games are nowadays, but they're supposed to be hard, at, at least in my mind. Much like with any puzzle, the player is supposed to make mistakes. Maybe we're in a day and age where people say they love strategy games, but the strategy games they play are so heavily player favored that while the player thinks they're being smart, in reality the game is just much more forgiving. No lessons learned, just brutal head ramming and getting rewarded with the thought of cleverness. That's what I love about Dungeons of Aether. It respects the player enough to give them a challenge worth experiencing. This game on hard is hard. It can be brutal. Plenty of times I was faced with impossible odds. Items were damn near necessary on some encounters, and sometimes I knew that I'd have to take hits just to win. But it was so worth it. I feel like at the highest difficulty, the player gets to experience and explore the depth of this battle system and its variables at its fullest, needing to consider every strategy and idea, having to come up with new ones on the fly and understanding the game more, digging deeper and deeper into an endless discovery to hundreds of differing outcomes and scenarios. There's so much more that so many people on the surface level are bound to miss. This game is genius but only if you can show it the respect that it shows you. And sadly from the looks of it, not everyone did. Maybe some saw this cartoonish, colorful RPG and expected something simple and sweet. A strategy game, where the only strategy was to not fall asleep from how simple it is. But that's not what Dungeons of Aether is. It beckons the player, and will you heed its call? I really do wonder how some of these people played the game, 
to say things like money is scarce, like, y'all know you can sell items, right? <laughs> but I mean, who cares? I enjoyed the game, and that's what matters to me. Although, a silly part of me who cares for popularity has a little fear when it comes to this game. However, I want to give my final thoughts on the story, which will involve some spoilers. Though I still won't show the final boss, it's too good to be experienced in any other form than just playing the game. So yeah, skip this spoiler segment if y'all are interested in this game. The story was neat. I thought the part with Fleet going and fighting the other characters was pretty cool, as the other characters first chapter involves them gathering these artifacts that give them a new passive in the following chapter, an example of differing scenario design to keep things fresh. But the player also gets to choose the order Fleet steals these artifacts, which carries on into the next time you fight her, making the final fight rather tough as she has a ton of buffs. I thought the Obsidian system was pretty interesting, with how if you use too much it would corrupt the shopkeepers. It made me wonder if I used them too much on the characters, would it corrupt them and change the ending? Like I never used the Obsidian on the characters because I was afraid. Like I low-key just sold these things because I didn't want to get a bad ending or something. So I was still upgrading the shopkeepers, because I didn't know yet. If I ever replay this game, I would be interested in doing a no Obsidian run. I think that'd be neat. And there's an achievement for that. Also, yeah. I don't know how they're supposed to make Fleet likable when she spends half the plot helping the most obvious villain I've ever seen. Like, sure, this game was probably made with a younger audience in mind, and Fleet's just this super excited, spunky adventurer. But I see her as an annoying goofer who helped the obvious bad guy destroy the world. Like, sure, in the end you saved the world, but what's the value when you're the one who caused it? But I guess she sealed the things away for good, and managed to get together with the other elementals to do it, and it's like a nice retelling of the original story, but this time some dumbass didn't mess up. But I really do like the relationship between these four, and the way that neither of them particularly like each other or even interact with each other that much. I mean, most of them don't even have dialogue with one another, but it's cool that Artemis just straight up tells Fleet that she's gonna come back to take over Julesville, and Fleet's just like, okay, when that day comes, I'll be waiting to take you out. Or Slate's just like, yeah, I don't really mess with you, but good job. Like, I don't know, I think it's neat when the main four characters of an RPG that are supposed to be together don't actually like each other that much. Kind of a twist on the strangeness of just randomly becoming friends and helping each other out that most RPGs have. Everyone here is only helping each other out because if they don't then the world is going to end, and they all have their own reasons they don't want that to happen. One character I haven't mentioned yet is Olympia. Olympia is this jerk ass, broke ass character, can't stand fighting against her. Oh, we're talking about Dungeon of Aether, Olympia? Whatever, every time she freezes me with the stupid ass crystal BS. I began to get tilted, especially when she was first released. I mean, I was playing Malawan release, so I was on my own BS. Loki had the power to crash the game with the press of a button. Story for another day, but it was funny. But this game reaffirms my suspicions. She's a jerk. But I do like her. Yeah, I don't know why this is a trend. She was only really mean to him here at first, but hey, that's Hammer. Don't, mm, don't be mean to him. She hails from a very exclusive group of people that few know about. It's not really certain why she's here at first, yet it's cool that we see all these different people from these groups coming together thanks to what's happening at Julesville. It's a great opportunity to introduce so many parts of the world from one. It makes this world feel big, makes me curious and interested in the other happenings of the world. But anyways, dear god, the final boss of this game, right? That's gotta be up there as one of the coolest final bosses I've ever fought in a video game. The gimmick of the fight, just how it all looked, and oh my god, the music. Golden Dark? I'm listening to it right now and it's making me shiver. So cool, so f***ing cool. I remember after beating this game, I was absolutely blown away on an unbelievable high. I just played something godlike. I don't know how y'all feel about this game. But you gotta admit, it ends incredibly. Godlike ending and final boss, they hit it out of the park tenfold. Perfect capture on why this game rocks so hard. I love the little epilogues for each character. I hadn't played through the rival's story for a while, but when I saw Slade's epilogue, 
I finally realized which part of the timeline it takes place in, with the merchant port being on fire. I just love these characters too. Seeing them split and follow their own paths and hints towards the future is cool. Like, darn fleet. I don't really mess with you like that. But I guess I'll see you in Rivals 2. But, let's wrap things up. Dungeons of Aether is just an incredibly fun experience. Amazing, colorful sprites, god tier music, and a gameplay system of infinite possibilities and strategies that I never got tired of. Aided by the countless differing scenarios the player experiences throughout the short journey to make it permafresh. I don't have any serious or huge complaints. This is just one of those really good experiences on all fronts. I mean, the random challenger dungeons are kind of whack, but I mean, I can just ignore that mode. Being a Rivals fan, I guess now an Aether fan, this is the first time I really became interested in the world and its characters. It's just never something I thought about. Like, you know, Rano, I like that guy, went out on a date with him once, but... <coughs> it's been really cool ever since 2015 when I first played Rivals to see the studio get made from it, all the different media stemming from it about this world, I kinda hope that Aether becomes more known for itself rather than Rivals of Aether. And that's what I was talking about earlier and kept hinting at. I kinda wonder how many people are playing this game because it's a new dungeon crawling RPG. And how many people are playing this game because they're Rivals fans. Like are the majority of players coming from Rivals of Aether? I wonder truly how many fresh fans are being made from this without any knowledge of Rivals of Aether. If people feel like they need to play Rivals in order to understand dungeons, or at the worst, just see this as some side spin-off game to Rivals, when it can stand on its own. Aether Studios is really trying to get off the ground, saying they're more than just Rivals, that this is a whole universe of games and media of all types. I commend them for that and wish them the best of luck, cause I think this stuff rules. I mean, I'm eating my own sock here because I opened the video up just talking about Rivals of Aether, but hey, when am I ever gonna tell y'all about my froggy and mothy boys? Give me the Molo plush, I will make them kiss. I, I, didn't, I didn't need to put that in the video. But yeah, that's my thoughts on Dungeons of Aether. If it looks like something y'all are interested in, then play it. For sure, definitely. Links in the description as always. And I'll catch y'all in the next dungeon. Special thanks to my Golly Gamer tier supporters, Ken Chiago and Seltris. Thanks to everyone for all the support. Weekly vids are starting back up for a bit, so get ready to enjoy some spacey action. I hope I can introduce y'all to more cool and unknown games like this one. But I'm heading out for now. Love y'all. And keep going, yeah? Peace.